Hello everyone in Cardiomyes channel and today we are speaking about controlling dyslipidemia. The 2019 AC guidelines of management of dyslipidemia have explained in detail the diagnosis and treatment of different types of dyslipidemia. In this new version of the 2021 guidelines of cardiovascular prevention, we are trying to focus about the brief management of dyslipidemia aiming for primary prevention in apparently healthy individuals or secondary prevention in patients with established cardiovascular disease. Let's at first mention some facts. The first thing is that the key initiating event in the process of atherogenesis is the retention of LDL and other cholesterol-rich lipoprotein within the arterial wall, and this is proved by multiple genetic, observational, and interventional studies. And the studies on the clinical safety of very low LDL have not caused any concern yet. Yes, sometimes some recommend monitoring for longer period for those with very low LDL, but so far no concern about the risk of very low LDL. Also, we need to emphasize that the relative reduction in the risk of cardiovascular disease is directly proportional to the absolute reduction in the level of LDL cholesterol, regardless the drug or the drugs used to achieve this. And there is no evidence so far for a lower limit for LDL or a J-curve effect. So there is no a minimum level below which there is no much reduction for the risk of cardiovascular disease. No, we can achieve much lower level that produce much reduction in the risk of cardiovascular disease. And the absolute benefit of lowering LDL depends on absolute risk of cardiovascular disease and the absolute reduction in LDL level. And we need also to remind ourselves that even a small absolute reduction in LDL cholesterol can result in significant absolute risk reduction, especially in high and very high risk patients. The common question. The lab profile sampling should be fasting or non-fasting. Non-fasting is recommended at the time being for general risk screening as it has the same prognostic value as fasting sample. So fasting is not a prerequisite for any level profile. But before mentioning this, we need also to mention that calculating LDL from non-fasting sample may be inaccurate in those with metabolic syndrome, diabetics, or hyper trichrysodemia. That's why some labs still prefer fasting samples, but non-fasting can be used for risk screening. We know that measuring LDL can be performed directly from the blood sample, but in most studies and also in many labs, it is calculated using a form called Fredvold formula. If we want to measure LDL in millimole per liter, which is used in many countries, it equals total cholesterol minus HDL minus 0.45 multiplied by triglycerides. And if you want to calculate it by milligram per deciliter, so it equals total cholesterol minus HDL minus 0.2 multiplied by triglyceride levels. And the calculation may be inaccurate when you are dealing with very low LDL or very high triglycerides. In this case, you need to measure directly from the serum sample. The common dilemma of which to choose as treatment target LDL or non-HDL cholesterol, which is calculated by subtracting HDL from the total cholesterol. Non-HDL has an advantage that it doesn't require the triglyceride concentration to be less than 400 in order to have an accurate calculation, and so it is accurate in non-fasting states and also in diabetics. This is a good advantage in comparison to LDL. So it can be used as a treatment target because it captures all the information regarding all the ABOB containing lipoprotein which are considered the atherogenic lipids, and so it can be used as a surrogate goal for all patients, especially those with hypertriglyceridemia or diabetics. And regarding ABOB lipoprotein, it provides a direct estimate of the total concentration of atherogenic lipid particles, especially in those with elevated triglycerides. And this information is nearly similar to that of calculated LDL cholesterol. So also it is a treatment surrogate, but not as important as the non-HDL cholesterol. 
That's why we need to know how to calculate the corresponding levels of non-HDL and apolipoprotein in comparison to the LDL goals. And so this table illustrates the equivalent level of non-HDL and apolipoprotein. If we want to make it much more easier, if you want to convert from LDL to non-HDL, you nearly add 30 mg per deciliter, whereas if you want to convert from LDL to apolipoprotein, you add 10. The first row is an exception where the equivalent LDL of 100 is nearly the same as apolipoprotein B, but in the next two rows we add 10 mg per deciliter. So now we know what are the advantage of using non-HDL or apolipoprotein in preference to LDL in some conditions. This diagram reminds us about the SCORE2 algorithm which was used in the risk stratification for apparently healthy population to calculate the 10-year risk of fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events but here this is called a live cardiovascular model which calculates a cardiovascular free lifetime gain from each 1 millimole per liter reduction in the LDL level and it depends on the age, gender, smoking status and systolic blood pressure. Now let's move to the treatment. We have a patient with abnormal lipid profile. What shall we do for this patient? We need to remind ourselves that sometimes this lipidemia is secondary to other diseases that we need to exclude before treating this lipidemia because treating this disease can improve the lipid profile like hypothyroidism, alcohol abuse, steroids, liver disease, nephrotic syndrome, and oral contraceptive pills. If these conditions are not present, so we are going to the specific treatment for this lipidemia per se. The first line of treatment of this lipidemia is the diet and lifestyle modification. And we should not omit this line because in many patients with mild or moderate increase in the lipid profile fractions, it is enough to adjust the diet exercise in order to improve the dyslipidemia without using medication. So I need to advise a patient with higher consumption of fruits, non-starchy vegetables, unsalted nuts, legumes, fish, vegetable oils, yogurt and whole grain and advise him about regular exercise and we have a detailed video about the diet and exercise that explains these elements and advise him again is the consumption of these food like red and processed meat, refined carbohydrate and I need to advise a patient much more about the correlation between this lipidemia and the high carbohydrate intake because many patients don't know this type of information, animal fats and dairy fats and the alcohol. But if this line failed to improve the lipid profile because of some genetic elements or if the patient couldn't adopt this healthy lifestyle, so I need to resort to the drug therapy. The most famous class of medication is the statins like atorvastatin, rosuvastatin and SEM statin which act on the key limiting step of the cholesterol biosynthesis which is the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme so they decrease LDL they also reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality by the pleiotropic effect of the statin on the atherosclerotic plaque so reducing the need for coronary intervention and we need not forget that it decreased triglycerides and so it reduced the risk of pancreatitis. That's why it is also used in treatment of hypertriglyceridemia. And statins are the drug of first choice in patients at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. That's why statin is an essential medication in any prescription for a cardiovascular patient. But also they have some adverse effects. The most famous is the myopathy, which is rare and it doesn't contribute to any increase in non-cardiovascular mortality, but it is a famous cause of discontinuation. Myalgia in most cases is not attributable to statins based on multiple trials, but many patients still report the side effect and so they stop statin despite all the benefits that they can get. So the management of patients with myalgia who does not have any increase in the muscle enzymes is based on trial and error. This means that I can switch him to a different statin or start with a small dose and then I perform gradual titration till I reach the maximally rated dose in order to reach the treatment target but I should not deprive him from the benefits of statin just for myalgia. The other common side effect is the increased liver enzymes which is famous between many patients. I need to reassure the patient that it is usually reversible and there is no need for, so far for routine monitoring of liver enzymes although it is a common practice by many doctors.
Another side effect that is not famous among doctors is the increased blood sugar and hemoglobin A1C, which is a dose-dependent effect and may occur after treatment initiation and is partially linked to slight weight gain. But we need also to emphasize that the benefit of statin outweighs the risk of increasing blood sugar and hemoglobin A1C for the majority of patients and by good advice about the diet, exercise and checking whether there is a risk of diabetes and need for medication at that time the side effect may become negligible. Fibrates are the second most common class of medication like the phenofibrate, bezafibrate and gemfibrozil. They stimulate something called peroxisome proliferator activated receptor alpha which lead to increased senses of lipoprotein lipase enzyme. So this induced clearance of VLDL and triglycerides by 30 to 60 percent. So their main effect is on the triglycerides rather than the cholesterol. And also it results in modest increase in HDL, so fibrates were one of the classical medications that increased level of HDL cholesterol. Despite this information, they are still the second choice after statin in hypertriglyceridemic patients, as we are going to say about the management of hypertriglyceridemia later in this video, and the evidence supporting the use of these medications for cardiovascular event reduction is still limited. That's why we are going to find that most of the recommendations regarding fibrates are still class 2B, even in hypertriglyceridemia, and they have no role so far for cardiovascular patients. Ezetimibe is a selective cholesterol absorption inhibitor that acts locally on the intestinal brush border and is considered to be a second line therapy either on top of statins when the target is not achieved by statins alone or when a statin cannot be prescribed or cannot be tolerated by the patient. That's why ezetimibe is one of the famous medication as an add-on medication or sometimes as a surrogate after statins. Cholesteramine is one of the classical medication that is considered a bile acid sequestrant and so it results in reduction in the level of cholesterol and triglyceride but the evidence on this medication is still limited that's why it is not as famous as is it and pempidoic acid is one of the recent medications that acts also on the cholesterol biosynthesis by inhibiting ATB citrate lyase enzyme so it can be combined with it in patients with statin intolerance and now to the revolution produced by these medication in the treatment of this lipidemia which are alirocumab and evolocumab the PCSK9 inhibitors. They are considered to be monoclonal antibodies that bind to proprotein convertase subtelicin kexin 9 which produce lysosomal degradation of LDL receptor. So binding this protein, this process is reduced, resulting in increased expression of LDL receptors on the cell membrane, so increasing LDL clearance and reducing LDL serum level. And PCSK9 inhibitors have produced efficacy in reducing LDL in those who don't tolerate the statins or those with familial hypercholesterolemia with multiple outcome trials that were performed in patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and it showed significant results regarding the reduction of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Also PCSK9 decreased triglycerides and lipoprotein A which is a famous pathogenic lipoprotein and increasing HDL and apolipoprotein A1 which is commonly correlated with HDL but the relative contributions of these modifications are still unknown and it need much more outcome trials. But of course they have some cones like being very expensive. I'm speaking about a parental medication to be taken once or twice per month. So of course it's very expensive. Cost effectiveness, long-term safety and efficacy in primary prevention are not yet known. Most of the outcome trials were performed for secondary prevention in patients with established cardiovascular disease, not for primary prevention goals. And the side effects like nasopharyngitis and injection site reactions. Enclizuran is also a parental medication recently approved for treatment of this lipidemia. It is considered to be a small interfering RNA that inhibits the production of PCSK9, so reducing LDL by 50 to 55 percent and it is only taken subcutaneous twice per year. That's why Enclizuran is one of the medications that also produce a revolution in the treatment of this lipidemia, but its effect on clinical outcomes remain to be established because it needs much outcome trials to prove their efficacy in patients with established cardiovascular disease to reduce morbidity and mortality.
Regarding nutraceuticals that many patients ask us about them, they are considered any substance that is food or part of a food that provide medical or health benefits targeting prevention or treatment of disease. So far, there are no outcome trials that have proved that nutraceuticals can prevent cardiovascular morbidity or mortality. So they are just considered dietary supplements, not a specific treatment for this lipidemia. And I should not advise a patient to take them. If you want to take them, it is based on the patient choice, but no evidence for benefit so far. The 2021 guidelines of cardiovascular prevention share the same opinion with the 2019 guidelines of this lipidemia that the ultimate goals for the LDL are the same and the stepwise treatment is advocated by both as it doesn't compromise goal attainment. No, it produces fewer side effects and higher patient satisfaction because I start with a smaller dose and then titrate it according to the LDL level in order to reach the treatment targets. So the task for this year recommend class 1 for a stepwise treatment intensification for apparently healthy people, for those with established cardiovascular disease or those with a specific risk group after considering the cardiovascular risk, treatment benefit, risk modifiers, comorbidities and patient preference. And also it is recommended that high intensity statin is prescribed up to the highest tolerated dose in order to reach the LDL goal determined for this patient according to his risk profile. Both guidelines also agree on the notion of lower is better, so we are allowed to have liberal intensification of the treatment if the patient is still using submaximal dose of statin and he is not experiencing any side effects, so he can increase the goal in order to reach the ultimate goal. And there are no difference so far in the relative risk reduction between males and females, younger and older patient at least up to age of 75, and those with and without diabetes. This diagram is important to put in your mind when you are prescribing a medication in order to expect how much LDL reduction he is going to achieve. So with moderate intensity statin, I expect 30% reduction. With high intensity statin like atorvastatin 40 or higher, rosovastatin 20 mg or higher, I expect 50% reduction. Adding ezetomibe can reach 65% reduction. Using PCSK9 alone can reach 60% reduction. Using PCSK9 with high intensity statin can reach 75%. And with adding ezetomibe, it can reach 85%. But we need to remember that the patients may vary according to their pharmacological response to the medication. And so the expected LDL reduction may be variable. That's why we need to have a follow-up lipid profile after about four to six weeks from any treatment initiation or change in the dosage in order to decide whether you have reached the goal or you need to intensify the treatment much more. What about if your patient is having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? We remember this diagram of the patient with established cardiovascular disease that we have two steps for treatment. In step one regarding LDL, we have a goal of 50% reduction from the baseline and less than 70 mg per deciliter. And then in step two, we intensify the treatment and go to much lower level of less than 55 mg per deciliter. So this advocates the concept of treatment intensification even in patients with established cardiovascular disease, but sometimes in very high risk patients like in case of acute or recent cardiovascular events, we can go directly to step two. So the task force has a class one recommendation for those patients to reach an ultimate LDL goal of less than 55 mg per deciliter and more than 50% reduction and remind ourselves with the word and not or so I need to have these two goals and if I couldn't reach the target goal with a maximum iterated dose of statin I can add ezetimibe. Also for the secondary prevention patients that didn't achieve this goal on both statin and ezetimibe combination therapy using a PCSK9 is recommended. This is the highest recommendation of the PCSK9 inhibitors in these guidelines because we are speaking about secondary prevention patient not primary prevention. What about if your patient is less lipidemic but he is apparently healthy? How are you going to deal with him? Using the SCORE2 algorithm, if he is considered to be at very high risk and is less than 70 years, so I need to reach an LDL goal of less than 55 
and more than or equal 50% from the baseline. So this is the same goal used in patients with cardiovascular disease. And if his calculated risk is at high risk, so the LDL is less than 70 milligram per deciliter and more than 50% reduction and also if the statin is not tolerated at any dose at the time I can consider zetomibe there is this also class 2a but if this patient is at very high risk without familiar hypercholesterolemia and he still doesn't reach the LDL goal on statin and zetomibe and can combine PCSK9 but this is class 2b because here we are speaking about primary prevention rather than secondary prevention. The use of PCSK9 also added to Izetimibe. If statin is not tolerated is also class 2B and if the goal is not achieved at the time using bile acid sequestering can be considered but it is still class 2B. That's why clostaramine is not commonly used in our clinical practice as Izetimibe. And the big no in this task force is for using statin in premenopausal females who are considering pregnancy or not using adequate contraception because you know that statins are contraindicated during pregnancy. So in this diagram dealing with apparently healthy population, we can find here that the LDL goal for those less than 70 years is less than 100 milligram per deciliter and if the patient is more than 70 he has the same goal but the class of recommendation is 2b and then if we go to step 2 if the patient is high risk I reach a goal of less than 70 if he is very high risk I reach a goal of less than 55 milligram per deciliter what about if your patient is hyper triglyceridemic rather than being hypercholesterolemic how are you going to deal with him so far there is no treatment goals for triglycerides but less than 150 milligram per deciliter is considered to indicate lower risk and here the higher levels may indicate the need to look for other risk factors that may be correlated with cardiovascular disease stellar statins are the first choice for treating hypertriglyceridemia when the level is more than 200 milligram per deciliter despite the notion that you may think that fibrates may be the first choice no statins are still the evidence-based medication for hypertriglyceridemia and the fibrates is class 2b if the patient cannot reach the target triglycerides to be less than 200 at the time i can add phenofibrate or bisafibrate this is just a class 2b a causament has been added in the guidelines of 2019 that in high-risk patients that cannot reach their goal despite statins, I can add the ecosabent at a dose of 2 gram twice per day, which is N3 polyunsaturated fatty acid, but it is also class 2B. It's a common question asked by many patients. How can I increase my HDL? The good cholesterol doctor. The answer is that there is no specific goal so far for HDL level in clinical trials. And so there is no treatment target that I want to increase the level of HDL for this patient, for example, to be more than 40 or 50 milligram per deciliter. But we need to emphasize that still low HDL is associated with high residual risk in cardiovascular patients. And also exercise and other lifestyle factors may also increase HDL and so I need to advocate them. There was also a famous medication in the past called the nicotinic acid that was used to increase the HDL. But so far there is no evidence for a practice that you use a medication just to increase HDL. You need to target the LDL, not HDL cholesterol and triglycerides. In the elderly, the treatment goals are still the same regarding LDL. And so treatment with statin is recommended in the same way as in younger patients and it is recommended that to start statin at a low dose if there is significant renal impairment in order to avoid potential drug interaction and it is class 2b to initiate statin for primary prevention in older patients more than 70 years if they are considered to be at high or very high risk this due to the lack of sufficient trials in this age category what about treating dyslipidemia in this specific risk group. In this famous diagram in diabetic patients, in step 1, if the patient is at high risk, at the time the LDL goal is less than 100 mg per deciliter, and then step 2 with treatment intensification, I need to reach less than 70 mg. In patient at very 
high risk I need to reach an LDL goal of less than 70 and then in step 2 I need to reach a lower level of less than 55 milligram per deciliter so there is a class 1 recommendation for patient with type 2 diabetes at very high risk like established cardiovascular disease or severe target organ damage to have an LDL goal of more than 50% reduction and less than 55 milligram per deciliter and in patients at high risk the goal is more than 50% reduction and less than 70 milligram per deciliter so these are the same goals used in apparently healthy population and as we used to do if the LDL goal is not reached on statin alone I can combine with ezetimibe and statin therapy may be considered in patients less than 40 years with type 1 or type 2 diabetes who have evidence of target organ damage and LDL more than 100 milligram but this is class 2b there is a class 1 recommendation to use statins or a combination of statins and ezetimibe in patients with non-dialysis dependent stage 3 to stage 5 CKD and patients who are already on statins, ezetimibe or combination at time of dialysis I need to continue this medication especially if this patient is having cardiovascular disease and the big no that we don't need to use statins in dialysis dependent CKD who are free of cardiovascular disease just because of the CKD itself there is no evidence so far for this practice. Regarding familial hypercholesterolemia to diagnose it from the start, we use the famous Dutch Lipid Clinic Network Diagnostic Criteria, which were used since the 2016 Guidelines of Cardiovascular Prevention, and it depends on a group of factors that give us some points that we calculate the total score for the patient. The first group is the family history. If the patient is having a first degree relative with premature cardiovascular disease or first degree relative with tendinous xanthomata or arcus Cornealis, clinical history regarding patient with premature coronary artery disease or premature cerebral or peripheral vascular disease, in the physical examination, presence of tendinous xanthomata or arcus cornealis before the age of 45 years, and LDL levels without treatment, each level range has a specific points and then the DNA analysis if you perform a genetic testing and you found functional mutation in LDR receptor ABOB or PCSK9 genes then I calculate the total score for the patient if he's having more than eight points so he has a definite diagnosis for familial hypercholesterolemia from six to eight points is a probable diagnosis and from three to five points it is a possible diagnosis and there is a class 1 recommendation in those patients who have calculated very high risk either due to having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or another major risk factor who do not achieve their goals on the maximally tolerated dose of statin and etetumibe to combine PCSK9 here it has a class 1 recommendation the same as in secondary prevention patients so at the end of this video that tried to give a brief regarding the management of this epidemia, we need to remind ourselves that identifying the target goal for each patient determine what is the possible treatment tool you can use for this patient depending on his risk profile. So it is not a universal treatment for all patients that all this epidemic patient I give them this medication at specific dose and then I'm going to increase it. No, I need to define the risk profile for this patient what would be his treatment goal and so I can determine what would be his best treatment modality thank you very much for watching this video and waiting the next video for controlling blood pressure